tonight I am going to be reading John Milne Bramwell's Hypnotism, Its History, Practice, and Theory. John Milne Bramwell was born in Perth, Scotland, May 11, 1852. The son of a physician, he studied medicine in Edinburgh, and after obtaining his degree of M.B., in 1873, he settled in Goole, Yorkshire. Fired by the unfinished work of Braid, Bernheim, and Lebo, he began in 1889 a series of hypnotic researches which, together with a number of successful experiments he had privately conducted, created considerable stir in the medical world. Abandoning his general practice and settling in London in 1892, Dr. Bramwell became one of the foremost authorities in the country on hypnotism as a curative agent. His works include many valuable treatises, the most important being Hypnotism, Its History, Practice, and Theory, published in 1903. And here, summarized for the world's greatest books by Dr. Bramwell himself. 1. Pioneers of Hypnotism Just as chemistry arose from alchemy, astronomy from astrology, so hypnotism had its origin in mesmerism. Phenomena such as Mesmer described had undoubtedly been observed from early times, but to his work which extended from 1756 to his death in 1815, we owe the scientific interest which, after much error and self-deception, finally led to what we now term hypnotism. John Eliotson, 1791-1868, through 1868, the foremost physician of his day, was the leader of the mesmeric movement in England in 1837 after seeing Dupotet's work. He commenced to experiment at University College Hospital and continued with remarkable success until ordered to desist by the Council of the College. Eliotson felt the insult keenly, indignantly resigned his appointments, and never afterwards entered the hospital he had done so much to establish. Despite the persistent and virulent attacks of the medical press, he continued his mesmeric researches up to the time of his death, sacrificing friends, income, and reputation to his beliefs. The fame of mesmerism spread to India, where in 1845, James Esdale, 1808 through 1859, a surgeon in the East India Company, determined to investigate the subject. He was in charge of the native hospital at Hooghly and successfully mesmerized a convict before a painful operation. Encouraged by this, he persevered and at the end of a year reported 120 painless operations to the government. Investigations were instituted and Esdale was placed in charge of a hospital at Calcutta for the express purpose of mesmeric practice. He continued to occupy similar posts until he left India in 1851. He recorded 261 painless capital operations and many thousand minor ones, and reduced the mortality 
for the removal of the enormous tumors of elephantitis from 50 to 5%. According to Elliotson and Esdale, the phenomena of mesmerism were entirely physical in origin. They were supposed to be due to the action of a vital curative fluid, or peculiar physical force, which under certain circumstances could be transmitted from one human being to another. This was usually termed the OD or odilic force. Various inanimate objects, such as metals, crystals, and magnets, were supposed to possess it and to be capable of inducing and terminating the mesmeric state, or of exciting or arresting its phenomena. The name of James Braid, 1795-1860, to is familiar to all students of hypnotism. Braid was a Scottish surgeon practicing in Manchester, where he had already gained a high reputation as a skillful surgeon. When in 1841 he first began to investigate mesmerism, he successfully demonstrated that the phenomena were entirely subjective. He published Neurypnology, or The Rationale of Nervous Sleep, in 1843, and invented the terminology we now use. This was followed by other more or less important works, of which I have been able to trace 41, but all have been long out of print. During the 18 years braid devoted to the study of hypnotism, his views underwent many changes and modifications. In his first theory, he explained hypnosis from a physical standpoint. In the second, he considered it to be a condition of involuntary monodeism and concentration, while his third theory differed from both. He recognized that reason and volition were unimpaired, and that the attention could be simultaneously directed to more points than one. The condition, therefore, was not one of monodeism. He realized more and more that the state was a conscious one, and that the losses of memory which followed on waking could always be restored in subsequent hypnoses. Finally, he described as double consciousness, the condition he had first termed hypnotic and then monodeistic. Braid maintained an active interest in hypnotism up to his death, and indeed, three days before it, sent his last M.S. to Dr. Azam of Bordeaux as a mark of esteem and regard. Sympathetic notices appeared in the press after his death, all of which bore warm testimony to his professional character. Although hypnotic work practically ceased in England at Braid's death, the torch he had lighted passed into France. In 1860, Dr. A. A. Libo, 1823-1900, began to study hypnotism seriously, and four years later gave up general practice, settled in Nancy, and practiced hypnotism gratuitously among the poor. For twenty years his labors were unrecognized. Then Bernheim, one of those patients Lebo had cured, came to see him, and soon became a zealous pupil. The fame of the Nancy school spread. Lebo's name became known throughout the world, and doctors flocked to study the new therapeutic method, while Lebo's work may justly be regarded as a continuation of Braid's, there exists little difference between the theories of Charcot-Salpetriere school and those of the later mesmerists. <laughs>